virgin most powerful radio sharing the gospel with clarity and charity and now virgin most powerful radio is pleased to present hands-on apologetics with renowned catholic author and apologist gary machuda And it's that time again. Time to jump into apologetics. Yes, you are listening to Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo, Hands-On Apologetics. I'm Gary Machuda. And welcome, everyone. Uh, Glad to have you with us. We got an awesome show in store for you today. In fact, today's guest is a good friend of mine and author and convert from Judaism. Roy Showman is coming into the dojo. Uh, We're going to talk about scientific apologetics sharing the faith and uh in exploring different ways to share the faith so every time i i talk to roy i always feel like uh, my iq increases he is such a brilliant thinker and um so it's going to be a lot of fun go and learn a lot and by the way for those who uh are, are maybe not familiar with roy uh you can go to virgin most powerful org, click on the show uh banner, I guess, and go to Hands-On Apologetics and scroll down to January 22nd. That's when I had Roy on my show last. We talked about his conversion from Judaism. It was a great show. So uh, anyway, I'm fired up to, to talk to him again and kind of tap his brains in terms of arguments and so on. And as always, you're part of the show. So if you can, give us a call, especially when Roy's on the air at 888-526-2151. That's 888-526-2151. Or you can email us at questions at handsonapologetics.com. And that is the Dojo Mailbox. And it's also time for me to give the shout-outs for those watching live stream on Facebook and YouTube. Hello, everybody. It's great to see some familiar names on the uh, the chat room. Yes, and bless Monday to you, too, as well. Uh, <laughs> I love the, the explosion of emojis on uh, social media during the program love it all right gang well um i hope you had a great weekend and uh we also have a great week in store for you today kicking off with roy um I, in fact i'm going to save it till the end of the program i'll give you a list of the guests that are coming up a uh, great line of guests for us but before we begin as always we do our um exercises and today's exercise is finding the fallacy and meet the early church father and then uh, we'll bring our guest on board uh, finding the fallacy today's finding the fallacy is the fallacy of equivocation i love this fallacy because equivocation is really easy to understand it's when you use the same word or term but in different senses in the argument okay so use the same word but the word can be used in different senses so, for example, um, uh, many jokes, by the way, are, are based on equivocation. You know, using uh, the word one way and then turning around to an unexpected twist at the end. This happens somewhat in Catholic apologetics and Christian apologetics because sometimes uh, we don't define our terms very well. And so when you, um, when you uh, uh, are talking to someone, it's important. To stop them and really get a good definition. Otherwise, you can un- end up with an equivocation. For example, tradition. Okay, somebody could argue that uh, people do things according to tradition, and Jesus rejects tradition. So therefore, we shouldn't, uh, let's say, have turkey on Thanksgiving or something like that. Well, you know, you can see there that there is a. Um, <laughs> the word is being used differently in two different senses. Tradition, in the first sense, people do things according to tradition, just means as a ha- custom or habit. Um, Jesus was rejecting a particular kind of tradition when he rejected tradition in the Gospels, namely the uh, tradition of the elders, insofar as they undermined the word of God for the sake of this uh ruling or teaching so tradition is used in two different senses in that word and sometimes uh, equivocation can also be uh, a bit difficult to determine Uh, i ran across this now 
I, I should probably use the most obvious examples as, as uh, you know, for for you rather than the most obscure. But this one was kind of, I wasn't quite sure you know, something was wrong with the argument. And then finally, I pinned it down to a equivocation. And it's this. Some people claim that prophets ceased after the time of Artaxerxes, which is roughly the time of Esther. And therefore, because prophets ceased, you couldn't have any inspired prophetic writing. Okay. And like I said, I wrestled with that for quite a while until I realized that there was an equivocation on the word prophets. You know, there's a difference between a prophet who's recognized as a prophet, you know, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, Elijah, that type of thing, and also the author of prophetic scripture, and who, by the way, may not be somebody who is recognized as a prophet. Uh, for example, Ezra and Nehemiah, they, in scripture, they're not identified as prophets. But because they wrote inspired scripture, we, we say that they are prophets in the, in the sense that uh, they're capable of writing down inspired, revealing truths. Okay, so it's kind of a different kind of prophet. And so the argument that prophets ceased after the time of Artaxerxes, and therefore uh, there weren't any prophets to write inspired writings, uh, simply is equivocation on the word prophet. So it can be, you know, equivocation can be very obvious. It can also be a bit obscure. But, uh, you know, so it's always good to define terms, right? To define terms, and then uh, if you could define them, then you can avoid the case of equivocation. Okay, so let's jump to the Meet the Early Church Father segment. And today's Early Church Father is actually not an individual, but a writing. It is the Didache. So that's our Early Church Father. By the way, this is also an ap considered an apostolic father at that, in the sense that it was written roughly around the time of the Apostles to shortly after the time of the Apostles. Now, what is the Didache? Well, the Didache means teaching. And it's basically the title of a document, uh, which is called The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles. It's a church manual. Actually, it's possibly the very first canon law that we have in existence. And basically what it is, is it's not so much a teaching uh, document as much as regulations, how to do things. Okay, um, It's written very early on. It's a little hard to pinpoint the date. Most scholars played it uh, just right after the turn of the first century. And um, it talks about things like baptism, fasting, communion, and stuff like that. And I thought it was worth maybe doing a few short quotes and uh, notice some of the doctrine that's in encapsulated in this church law. Okay, For example, in the Didache 1-2, it says the, commandment, uh, the second commandment of the teaching, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not seduce boys, you shall not commit fornication, you shall not steal, you shall not practice magic, you shall not use potions, you shall not procure abortion or destroy a newborn child. So here we have one of the earliest condemnations of abortion in the Didache. Also in 414 of the same document, it says, Confess your offenses in the church and do not go up uh, to your prayer with an evil conscience. This is the way of life. So we have a hint at a confession of sins in the church. Possibly a hint to a sacrament of confession, I would say. In regards to baptism, the Didache says this. This is in 7.1, by the way. In regards to baptism, baptize thus. After the foregoing instructions, baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and living water. If you don't have living water, then baptize in other water. If you are not uh, available in cold, then in warm. If you have neither, pour water three times on the head in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Before the baptism, let the one baptizing and the one to be baptized fast. Also, others uh, who are able command that one who is to be uh, baptized to fast beforehand for one or two days. Now, what's interesting here is that there are many Christians out there that believe that the only valid form of baptism is total immersion in water. Yet, here we have in the Didache, um, this very early apostolic document, um, saying that, no, if, if you can't do that, if you can't uh, have access to living or running water, 
you can just pour the water on the forehead. Very cool. Finally, in the Didache, you know, one more quote. We'll, I think we can squeeze it in before the break. In 14.1, it says this. On the day of the Lord, gather together, break bread, and give thanks. After confessing your transgressions so that your sacrifice may be pure. Let no one who has a quarrel with his neighbor join until he is reconciled, lest your sacrifice be defiled. For this is that which is proclaimed by the Lord, quote, In every place and time, let there be offered to me a clean sacrifice, for I am a great king, says the Lord, and my name is wonderful among the Gentiles. Quoting Malachi 1.11. Now, notice here that the Didache it calls the Eucharist a sacrifice. And in fact, it relates to it several times. And it also includes a quote, a very famous prophecy about the sacrifice of the Mass in Malachi 1.11, where it's prophesied that, in every land, a pure sacrifice will be offered to the Lord, um, and not just in Jerusalem. So uh, there's lots of other great things. I wish <laughs> maybe we had a longer segment. I'd love to go through some more quotes from the Didache. Okay. But by the way, this is available free online. And so uh, one of my favorite sources is uh, newadvent.org. It's all one word, newadvent.org. Uh, not only does it have all the early church fathers, you can just click on that and read from the Didache and all the other great writings that we, we quote on this program. Uh, but also you can access things like St. Thomas's Summa Theologica and the Bible and all sorts of great stuff. All right, so that's our Meet the Early Church Father for today, the Didache. Coming up next, after the break, Roy Showman's going to join us to talk about scientific apologetics. It's going to be a lot of fun, folks. Stay tuned. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. 
Here's Gary. And welcome back, everyone. Well, it's time for our guest. In fact, this guest I truly enjoy talking to because he always has these incredible insights that I just ponder for the rest of the week. The guest is Roy Showman. He received his Bachelor of Science from MIT and an MBA uh, magna cum laude from Harvard Business School. He's the author of two awesome books, and I recommend both of these highly. It's Salvation is from the Jews and also Honey from the Rock, 16 Jews Find the Sweetness of Christ. Roy also is the host of a weekly hour-long live call-in radio show on Radio Maria. Uh, the name is Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism with Roy Showman. Uh, it can be heard live on Saturdays at 3 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on RadioMaria.us. Or you can also listen to it on the Radio Maria Smart app. Roy Showman, welcome to Hands-On Apologetics. Great to be back. Boy, Roy, uh, yeah, uh, we talked, I can't believe it, it was January 22nd, I think, was the the uh, time you were on the show. Time has flown. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no shortage of things to talk about. Yeah, that's true. So uh, if you wouldn't mind, if you, just a couple of minutes, if you could maybe just give a, a short uh, description of your journey to the Catholic faith. Okay, well, I was born and raised Jewish. My parents were both Holocaust refugees, German-Jewish. Um, I went to MIT. Under, I was devout as a child. I went to MIT undergraduate. I lost my faith in the pseudoscientific worldview at MIT. Science has all the answers. Religion is just a superstition before science had all the answers, which is, of course, what we're going to talk about today. Um, I um, got a Bachelor of Science from MIT. I went on to Harvard Business School after some years of working as an engineer. Um, got an MBA, magna cum laude, was invited back to join the faculty, was a, a marketing professor on the faculty of Harvard Business School, was depressed because life had no meaning and we're just a chemical accident and you know, we live and we die and that's it. And in that depression, I had a theophany walking in nature. I um, fell into the presence of God and I saw my life in the presence of God as I would see it after death, looking back over my life in the presence of God. I understood how I would feel about everything after I died, what I'd be happy about, what I would wish I had done differently. I saw the meaning of life. I saw that we live forever. I saw that every action has a moral content that's recorded for all eternity, that every time we take advantage of an opportunity to do something of value in the eyes of heaven, we will be literally rewarded for all eternity for that. Um, and I obviously I saw that the meaning and purpose of my life was to worship and serve my Lord and Master and God who was revealing himself to me. But I didn't know who it was. I didn't know what religion this was. I couldn't think of it as Judaism. I went back home, um, happy like I had never been before. I knew we lived forever. I knew that absolutely everything that ever happened to us was the most perfect thing that could be arranged coming from the hands of an all-knowing, all-loving God. I knew that we were, every moment of our existence, we, was, we were held in an ocean of love greater than we could ever hope for, coming from this all-knowing, all-loving God. And all I wanted to do was find out who he was and what religion to follow, to worship and serve him properly. So every night before going to sleep, I would say a short prayer to know the name of my Lord and God and Master who had revealed himself to me in that first experience. A year after that first experience, I went to sleep. I thought I was woken by a hand on my shoulder and led to a room and left alone with the most beautiful young woman I could ever imagine. I knew without being told that it was the Blessed Virgin Mary. She offered to answer any questions I might have for her, so I asked her about five or six questions, which she graciously answered. Then she spoke to me a little longer, and then the audience was over. I went back to sleep. The next morning when I woke up, I knew it had been Christ in that first experience. And I knew that I wanted nothing other than to be as fully and completely a Christian as possible. I didn't know the difference between a Protestant and a Catholic, um, but I knew who the Blessed Virgin Mary was. I really knew who she was, and that led <laughs> me pretty directly to the Catholic Church. So I don't think I've ever done it in you know, like 96 seconds before, but there you have it. <laughs> you know, that was, you did an outstanding job, too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, going back to, uh, I guess it would be the days where... Uh, you were trying to find meaning in life through uh, education, you know, science, uh, that type. Of I, wa thing. I wasn't. I, I wasn't really. I mean, I, I mean, I'm happy to go back to the days at MIT, but yeah. um, no, I wasn't. I, I, I wasn't trying to find meaning in life through science. I just, I just 
thought there was no no rational choice other than to take a materialistic, atheistic, uh, scientific worldview. Okay, so it was more of a default than than. Um... Oh yeah, it definitely was entirely default. I guess that's that's what I kind of wanted to underline. Yeah. So yeah, you know, if you could. Happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could talk to your former self, uh, how would you approach? You know, how would uh, how would you approach? Uh, you know, someone who uh, basically... That's very you know. easy. That's extremely easy because all of the scientific evidence is in favor of the truth of the Catholic Church. I mean, the um, I would say to the former Roy, so to speak, um, okay, let's look at the evidence. Let's look at the physical, verified evidence. I have a hypothesis to explain it, which is that the Catholic Church is true, that God exists, that the spiritual world exists, and so forth. Um, if you want to reject that hypothesis, you have my blessing, but come up with an alternative, which can also explain the data, that can also explain the evidence. And the former Roy would be unable to, because there is no other hypothesis that can explain the evidence, except to say, as Emile Zoli famously said, essentially, I don't care what the evidence is. I could be seen, shown all the physical evidence in the world, but I would refuse yeah. to believe because I refuse to believe. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, that's and he's kind of uh, epitomizes <laughs> the old. In fact, just to give the background to that, uh, he was uh, at Lourdes in France, which of course is the famous uh, site of Mary's apparition, and, and there's uh, water that there's many miraculous healings, and he actually witnessed a miraculous healing. And uh, despite that, in his novel, he uh, he made it into a false healing, you know, a kind of psychosomatic cure. And uh, someone said, you know, why would you do that? And eventually that's his answer is, even if I saw all the people in Lourdes healed, it would not change me one bit. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so Before he went there, he said, quote, only nervous cases are healed at Lourdes. If I saw a cut finger dipped into the water and come out whole, I would believe. And then when he was there, he saw <laughs> a woman with an entirely eaten away face, you know, just one open wound, so to speak, and and she was uh, dying of um, an advanced stage of lupus and pulmonary tuber tuberculosis and um, leg ulceration. She went in a bath. She emerged completely cured, you know, completely physically looking normal. Um, the uh, doctor at Lourdes turned to Zola, Zola and say, said, Ah, Monsieur Zola, behold the case of your dreams. Zola's response was, I don't want to look at her. To me, she is still ugly. Were I to see all the sick at Lourdes cured, I would not believe in a miracle. And when he went back home, he, when she challenged him, because he, he falsely wrote about her in his book and claimed that she wasn't healed, um, he, she went to see him to confront him, and he tried to bribe her to pension her and her husband off to live in an obscure little town in Belgium for the rest of their lives so that she could not be produced as evidence yeah and right this is not good faith <laughs> this is not acting <laughs> in good faith right in fact uh didn't he didn't he kill her off in the novel if i'm i um i yes i think she died on the train home actually in the novel that's right yeah <laughs> yeah you would think that that doesn't seem like a very open scientific you know approach to the data at least uh, he seemed like at the beginning he was willing to accept data, but then when he's confronted with the facts, suddenly the tables have turned. Yeah. He, well, he's only willing to accept data that confirms him in his preconception. Um, there's a, a wonderful quote of G.K. Chesterton. I hope you refer to him frequently on your show, but anyway. <laughs> um, he wrote, uh, the believers in miracles accept them rightly or wrongly because they have evidence for them. The disbelievers in miracles deny them rightly or wrongly because they have a dogma against them. <laughs> so The blind faith is not on the part of people who believe in miracles. It's on the part of people who refuse to believe in them. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's a, it's, um, it's a belief in miracles is driven by the evidence, where uh, denial of miracles seems to be driven by the belief that miracles can happen. And that drives the evidence. That, yeah, that's right. That drives the conclusion, and, and which is actually the, the only thing they can do 
the, okay, I may talk a little bit too much about this, but it's because I'm working on a book on this. But no, go ahead. Um, go ahead. The only thing they can do is either um, basically say all the witnesses are lying, basically dismiss the evidence, uh, wh whatever it is, dismiss it on the basis that it's, it's fraudulently produced or all the witnesses are lying and so forth, discount it before beginning, um, or if they can't do that because there's physical evidence like the Shroud of Turin, then they come up with comical comical false I don't want to call it explanations or analogies like they have for the Shroud of Turin um, you can find you know like the History Channel or whatever saying that you know like a corpse was dusted with ochre powder and a sheet wrapped over it and that produces the image well you can do that and the image doesn't bear any resemblance at all to the Shroud of Turin but you have this transparent claim that then people can just say, oh, no, 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 I saw a History Channel documentary. I know how that was. Before they proved it. Yeah, yeah, right. And so uh, it's almost that like any evidence will suffice to overturn it. Uh, you know, even if it's the it, it, it's weak or it doesn't even correspond to uh, what it's supposed yeah, to disprove. Yeah, even if it doesn't hold water at all, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's... That's interesting phenomenon. Now, in, in the former, Roy, uh, were you as dogmatic about your materialism as that, or do you think you'd be at least interested in the evidence? Oh, I, I wasn't. Um, I, I wasn't dogmatic about it. Um, this is perhaps a little bit embarrassing, but I was inconsistent, as are actually, actually most people probably who. I don't want to say who don't have the faith are inconsistent in their belief set. So um, I didn't believe in God. I thought that, you know, we were a chemical accident, but I was still a little bit new agey. And so I, I probably believed in ESP. I believed in maybe mind over matter in some way, you know, that which actually falls into that category of really thin theories that, you know, where you grasp at anything to to avoid the natural conclusion but I probably believed in, you know, psychic phenomena and so forth. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, it's not only non-believers, but believers are inconsistent, too. You know, we could affirm our faith in God in church, and then for some reason, when it gets to the parking lot, you know, all bets are off, <laughs> and we act like no, uh, uh, non-believers. Yeah, well, that's... Cut us a little slack for falling in human nature, <laughs> would you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I hear the, the music starting to come up. We're talking with Roy Showman. We're talking about scientific apologetics, and uh, it's, it's a great program. You want to stay tuned. Uh, you're listening to Hands-On Apologetics, and we'll be right back right after the break. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support 
because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. We're talking with Roy Showman. Roy is the author of two outstanding books. If you don't have them, run out and get them. Uh, it's Salvation is from the Jews and Honey from the Rock, 16 Jews Find Sweetness of Christ. Both of them are available through Ignatius Press. And also, Roy has a great radio show. You should check it out. It's a Saturday, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on uh, Radio Maria Network. It's Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism. So uh, just want to give a plug because uh, two, out, I mean, lots of outstanding stuff. And uh, we're talking to Roy about scientific apologetics. And Roy, earlier you mentioned uh, if you could meet your former skeptical self, uh, you would present evidence and uh, challenge him to come up with an alternative explanation. Well, let's talk a little bit about that evidence. What would you, uh, what would you present to him? Um, I would. Um, okay, I, I could go down a list. Uh, the medical okay. healings of Lourdes, which are attested to by uh, uh, they, they need physical evidence of the condition before, physical evidence of the condition after. The healings have to be instantaneous. They have to be um, unreversed. I mean, they have to be permanent. There can't be any natural explanation, and so forth and so on. They have to be very heavily documented, and there, there are um, thousands that have passed those criteria. You have the miracle of the sun at Fatima, which was seen by at least 80,000, 100,000 people, including skeptics and, and atheists and communists who were intending to dismiss it. In other words, went there just to make fun of the ignorant peasants who thought something would happen. You have the Shroud of Turin, which is a favorite of mine, because um, you know its, its provenance has been known fully since at least the 13th, 14th century, and yet even today it couldn't be forged with all of our technology today. Um, you ha exorcisms are a favorite of mine because you have um, you not only have the behavior of the possessed person at exorcisms, you know the superhuman strength and so forth. The fact that they frequently speak in Hebrew or Aramaic or Latin languages, which the human being being exorcised doesn't know. Um, they have violent responses to hidden crucifixes in the room or hidden holy water or so forth, and they also have violent responses to um, things that the exorcist is just saying in his head, and yet they are fully aware and respond to it and so forth. Um, I mean, you have the Eucharistic miracles, um, and you have the famous ones from the Middle Ages like Lanciano and so forth, but you also have ones from the 20th century. You have a that that I mean, you have one from in uh, that happened in Argentina in Buenos Aires in 1996 and went through the full medical examination of of the um, of the miraculous host. And you had one in 2008, I think it was in France, again, where um, it was subjected to, you know, full contemporary scientific examination. Um, so I guess I could stop there, but I could also go on. Right. There's, yeah. there's well, no shortage of physical evidence. Yeah, that's true. And especially... Um as you, you know, I think uh, Lourdes definitely would qualify as uh, being scientifically, you know, and rigorously documented, because um, if any healings that occurred at Lourdes, if they don't have documentation about their, uh, you know, original diagnosis, they're not even, you know, the, the process stops there. They have to have 
complete documentation, right? Yes, and, and it has to be, they have to have physical, uh, physical evidence. So basically, if there aren't x-rays, if there aren't lab test results and so forth, they're not even considered. Okay, so someone could say, yeah, but these are Christian doctors and they're, you know, their faith probably colors their uh, their. Uh, but they aren't Christian doctors. And stuff. The Medical Bureau of the Lords is very careful to allow, I, I believe it's no more than one-third Catholic doctors and um, one-third um, atheist doctors have to be on the board. Oh, wow. I didn't know that they actually had uh, levels that, you know, quotas they had to be. I, I think... <laughs> um, I, I'm, 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 I, I know they do that. I, I know they do. I'm not a hundred percent sure of what they are, but they yeah. want to insulate themselves from that accusation that these are um, polemicists trying to proselytize by, you know, pseudoscience or whatever. So they're careful about that. That's true. And then even with the medical examinations done, that is still not proclaimed a miracle, is it? It still has to go to the church for another examination. Actually, actually, it's in some sense, it's a two-stage process. The Medical Bureau of Lourdes, when, when they do all of the documentation before and after and the follow-up, I think it's six years or something, they will attest to the healing having no natural explanation and being miraculous. However, to be proclaimed by the Church a miracle, there has to be a second process done by the bishop of the diocese where the person resides. And so the Medical Bureau of Lourdes has approved well over a thousand miracles, but I think only about 70 or 80 have been canonically pronounced by the Church because, frankly, that's an expensive process. And usually when the person goes back home, the local bishop isn't interested in spending a couple of hundred thousand dollars to go through the whole attestation again just to get the church to confirm it. Yeah, that that amazes me because a lot of people actually do receive miraculous healings at Lourdes, but they just don't bother, you know, even going to the medical bureau. They just go home happy, you know. So and then so there's a kind of a it's probably a much greater number that's out there. It, you know, even before you enter the part where there's medical scrutiny and, uh, you know, looking at it for permanent results and so on, uh, the actual numbers are probably much higher. They are undoubtedly much higher, but um, the fact that there are over a thousand that went through the rigorous uh, protocol of the medical bureau there is, is pretty impressive. Yeah. How, now, with the miracle of the sun, now that's strictly not speaking uh, scientific, uh, but oh, yeah. it is. A, I'll take you on on that. Okay. Yeah. Well. Okay. How would you How would you explain it as scientific? Um, any Any other circumstance, if you have eighty thousand witnesses who all agree, that's considered pretty substantive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I, I'm. Well, I didn't say it was insubstantial. I just said I, I don't think it, it would be well, considered scientific. I, uh, well, the, uh, I, I actually think, basically, I, I actually think it is. Um, okay. We'd have to get into a definition of, of, of what constitutes scientific, but if you have, um, oh, just, I mean, almost anything ends up to being eyewitness accounts, even if it's somebody who read an EKG or somebody who looked at an X-ray, it ends up being somebody swearing to what they saw okay that yeah, fair enough fair enough and uh yeah so uh, go ahead i'm sorry there's one thing that i uh, the miracle of fatima the miracle of the sun is an interesting illustration of the phenomenon of fake explanation right because you have the situation where at least 80,000 people saw it, and the communist government because uh, at the time it was a communist government in lisbon actually sent people out there just to prove that the miracle didn't happen, and they attested the fact that it did happen. So yeah. then you have the fact that, okay, believers and non-believers alike saw the same thing. Well, we need an explanation that denies the faith, so we'll say it was a mass hallucination. That's wonderful. Now they have a name for it. Now they have an alternative explanation. The problem is there's no such thing as a mass hallucination. But the fallacy is that once you have generated a name, somehow you've generated a phenomenon. You know better than I do what what category of fallacy to call that. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh <laughs> No, you're absolutely right. 
Uh, so it's just simply naming it doesn't explain it, you know. And no, like you said, there, there's no. I'm sorry. People people take it as an explanation. Then they just say, "Oh, the miracle of Fatima." Everyone knows that was a mass hallucination. End of story. Right, right, yeah, and like you said, uh, mass hallucinations. Don't, you know, where's the evidence for that? And you also have the problem of people who uh, didn't believe seeing it, you know, and attesting to it, and also people from miles away seeing it, you know. Uh, you might be able to say there might have been a s- small group of enthusiasts that wanted to see something, uh, but it just doesn't fit the data, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we got <clears throat> maybe a, a, about a minute or uh, about two minutes. Uh, the Shroud of Turn, you pinpointed the one fact that you would emphasize is the ability to repl- replicate it. Uh, is that really what it comes down to with the Shroud? Well, that, I think that's pretty compelling, first of all, yeah. because if the alternative explanation is it was fraudulently produced, one has to hypothesize how that could have happened, and there's no explanation. But there are also a number of physical characteristics of the shroud, on the shroud, that um, even if somebody could have forged it, so to speak, they didn't, wouldn't have known enough to forge it, um, yeah. such as the behavior, the separation of blood, uh, you know, the, the red blood cells from the plasma um, and the case of um, extreme trauma, and which is reflected in the blood stains on the shroud. Uh, there's, you know, there's a blood colored stain and then around it, there's a wider area of, of um, much closer to, you know, water colored stain. And it turns out that when somebody is severely, severely tortured, that happens to the blood, and there are lots of things like that on the shroud of, um, that basically scientific details, which are not known until very recently. Right, and also There's it also differs fact- from... Oh, go ahead, I'm go sorry. Ahead. Oh, I was go just ahead. going to say it, it differs from the uh, traditional depiction of the crucifixion as well. You mean you mean because the, the nail holes are on, on the wrist? Yes, for instance? right. Yeah. Yeah, although actually that's, um, uh, yeah, that's not as much of a problem with the traditional depictions as it might seem, because it turns out that a very good way to crucify somebody, so to speak, um, and have them not, have their hands not rip off, is to insert the nail in the palm on one side, so it comes out of the wrist on the other side. So even that kind of apparent contradiction with the normal uh, iconography is is not a deal breaker. Yeah, yeah, very good. And the direction of the blood flows um, that show the angle where the uh, how the arms were held and uh, there are uh, hundreds of details that um, are just inexplicable. Absolutely. Well, we're talking with Roy Showman on Scientific Apologetics. Uh, really great discussion. Stay tuned, everybody. We'll be right back right after the break. This is Terry Barber inviting you all the men to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877 877- 526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. 
We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Hands-On Apologetics. We are talking with Roy Showman uh, about scientific apologetics and basically featuring miracles, you know, looking at uh, miracles and and showing that uh it's almost impossible to give alternative explanations. And we're just talking about the uh, Shroud of Turn. And uh, Roy, I think you, didn't you interview uh, Barry Schwartz on your program? Yes. Um, uh, I was thinking of making a plug for it. It's it's up on my, um, that interview is available on my website and also on my podcast. Um, it's a two hour interview with Barry Schwartz, who was a Jewish scientific photographer who was the official photographer of the Shroud of Turin project. And he's still Jewish, but he um, makes no bones about the fact that the only possible explanation for the Shroud is that it was uh, miraculously produced following the crucifixion of um, Jesus Christ. And although he admits that he can't scientifically prove that it was Jewish Jesus Christ, you know, because all he can scientifically prove is that it was a crucified man about 2,000 years ago. Um, he uh, presented the evidence to his mother, who was Jewish, and uh, he said to her, but of course I can't prove it's Jesus Christ. And she said to him, it's miraculously produced by a, of, a, of a man crucified 2,000 years ago by the Romans. Who else do you think it's going to be? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, why keep it along for two thousand years if it isn't, you know, the same? And why have it miraculous? But yeah, um, I love that line. So yes, yeah, so he he goes and I mean he knows far better than I do, but he goes into a great number of attributes of the shroud that are um, extremely precise scientifically and are uh, contradict the idea that it could have been produced any way other than miraculously. Yes, absolutely. And okay, so I, uh, you oh, go ahead. I just want to get to some like philosophical issues. I, I because yeah, I'd okay. like to talk for four hours, but I don't have four hours. <laughs> and um, be, and it came up a little bit when you said, you know, is the eyewitness testimony of eighty thousand people evidence, scientific evidence, or not? And I would argue that um, until very recently, it would always have been considered scientific evidence because the uh, traditional definition of science was the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the world through observation um, and experiment. And that observation, that's observation. The problem is that now scientific requires the, the word scientific is usually associated with the requirement to reproduce the result at will under controlled circumstances and uh, the ability to perform repeatable experiments to establish the scientific truth of something. Those two things, reproducibility at will and experimentation at will, um, they, don't, they by definition exclude miracles. It's in the nature of a miracle that it cannot be produced at, by, at will under arbitrary circumstances and that it is not subject to experimentation. So we have a circularity here where the contemporary definition of what's scientific is produced by uh, the, the fact that science is usually used in the context of the physical sciences, and therefore the term itself has kind of embedded 
these restrictions, which exclude the miraculous. The um, uh, obviously a result which is dependent by by nature on the particular circumstances or on who is involved cannot be replicated at will. And G.K. Chesterton, nobody is both astute and funny simultaneously in the way that G.K. Chesterton is. <laughs> so may I read a couple of quotes of his that debunk that circular reasoning? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so here's one. The question of whether miracles ever occur is a question of common sense and of ordinary historical imagination, not of any final physical experiment. One may surely here dismiss that quite brainless piece of pedantry, which talks about the need for scientific conditions in connection with alleged spiritual phenomena. If we are asking whether a dead soul can communicate with a living one, it is ludicrous to insist that it should be under, condi- under conditions under which no two living souls in their senses would communicate with each other. If you choose to say, I will believe that Miss Brown called her fiancé an endearing term, if she will repeat the word before 17 psychologists, then I shall reply, very well, if those are your conditions, you will never get the truth, for she certainly will not say it. It is just as unscientific as it is unphilosophical to be surprised that in an unsympathetic atmosphere certain extraordinary sympathies do not arise. It is as if I said that I could not tell if there was a fog because the air was not clear enough, or if I insisted on perfect sunlight in order to see a solar eclipse. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, so in a sense, uh, what what they do is define opposition out of existence, you know, yeah. by and, demanding and certain other, circumstances. Another argument uh, is that, well, you know, the only witnesses to these things and the only participants are people with faith. So obviously, that's not reliable because they have faith, to which uh, G.K. Chesterton says... The skeptic may say that the miracle could only come to him who believed in it. It may be so, and if that is so, how are we to test it? Suppose we were investigating whether angry men really saw a red mist before their eyes. Suppose 60 excellent householders swore that when angry they had seen this crimson cloud. Surely it would be absurd to answer, Oh, but you admit you were angry at the time. They might reasonably rejoin, how the blazes could be cons- discover without being angry whether angry people see red. <laughs> so the saints and ascetics might rationally reply, suppose that the question is whether believers can see visions. Even then, if you are interested in visions, there is no point to object to it being believers. You are still arguing in a circle. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, that's beautifully put. In fact, uh, yeah, we're going to have Dale Alquist on tomorrow, so... This is great. It's warming us up for G.K. Chesterton. Yeah. So, so, uh, so the scientific, uh, the modern scientific view, in a sense, kind of, like I said, excludes uh, the faith response by definition. It's it just it can't be uh, admitted as as evidence. Well, my 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 actually my premise would be that the. Um, that, that the definition of what constitutes scientific has to be sensitive to the problem domain. Yes. And if you're talking about um, physics or chemistry, that fine. Then a reproducible, reproducible results is a reasonable criterion. If you're talking about the sovereign act of the free will of an individual, which in this case might even be God, or it might be a demon, or it might be the angels, you can't require reproducibility because that would deny the free will of the individual involved. Right. Exactly. Well, we have about three more minutes. Uh, Where else would you go? Well, I I just, I will read this if I, with your indulgence, this one story of a Eucharistic miracle in Buenos Aires in 1996 under then Archbishop Bergoglio, who we are actually Bishop Bergoglio, who we know as Pope Francis, because yes. people again dismiss these things from the Middle Ages as legends. Uh, and I can do it in three minutes, okay? Oh, okay. That no, sounds great. Okay, so Father Alejandro Pezet celebrated Mass. He distributed Holy Communion when some, he, somebody told him that someone had thrown away a host in the back of the church. So the priest took the host and put it in water to dissolve it, because that's actually the legitimate way to 
dissolve a defiled host, uh, basically to dispose of it, because eventually it dissolves completely in the water, at which point there's no divine presence in the host, and you can dispose of it in the earth. So, so he uh, put it in water, expecting it to dissolve, but a few weeks later, he saw that the host had become a bloody object in the water. So he informed the bishop, who was Bergoglio, and um, uh, photographs were taken to show it, and it was left in the water. And three years later, Bergoglio decided to submit it to scientific analysis. So he gave a sample of the host to uh, Dr. Zugiba, who is an expert on cardiology and forensic pathology, without telling him where it came from. So he gave him a piece of the transformed host, which appeared to be human muscle at that point. Hmm. The doctor, uh, here's the doctor's uh, uh, forensic report. The analyzed material is a fragment of the heart muscle found in the wall of the left ventricle close to the valves. The mu- this muscle is responsible for the contraction of the heart. Um, the heart muscle is in an inflamed state and contains a large number of white blood cells. This indicates that the heart was alive at the time the sample was taken. I affirm that the heart was alive since white blood cells die outside a living organism. Thus, their presence indicates the heart was alive when the sample was taken. What is more, these white blood cells had penetrated the tissue, which further indicates that the heart had been under severe stress, as if the owner had been beaten severely about the chest. So then the doctor who did this was informed that the substance, that the sample had been taken from from its originating source in 1996, which means three years earlier, at which point Dr. Zagiba asked, you have to explain one thing to me. If the sample came from a dead person, how could it be that while I was examining it, the cells of the sample were moving and pulsating? If the heart came from someone who died in 1996, that is three years earlier, how could it still be alive? Wow. So this is not from the Middle Ages. This is from 1996. They had plenty of science and forensic pathology in those days. <laughs> that's true. Wow. Wow. What, that's great evidence. Well, you know, I, we're right up at the end of the show. Roy, how can people get a hold of your uh, material? Uh, my website is salvationisfromthejews.com. Um, I have a YouTube channel. Um, but go to the website. You can find the YouTube channel and everything on there. You can find you know, dozens of talks I've given on uh, video and audio, all my radio shows archived. Um, I have a, uh, a, a podcast blog, blog.salvationisfromthejews.com. And I have a YouTube channel, if you spell my name right, which is S-T-H-O-E-M-A-N. Uh, you can find a lot of talks up on YouTube and so forth. So I'm around. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, thank you for having me. Thanks for the discussion. All right. Well, this is Roy Showman, everybody, and uh, definitely make use, access his work, because he's done some great work in uh, sharing, explaining, defending the faith. Um, all right. So, <laughs> great discussion, and the discussion continues this week. Uh, tomorrow, as I mentioned, we're going to have Dale Elquist come on, which is going to talk about G.K. Chesterton. Specifically, the genius of his apologetics. I can't wait to talk to Dale about him. Uh, uh, next, uh, let's see, this would be Wednesday's show. Dr. Stacy Tresecos is going to come on and talk her about her book, Particles of Faith. And also Thursday, Dr. John Bergsma. And uh, Dr. John, he's actually a convert to the faith. And uh, we're going to talk about the prophecies of Daniel. And... Uh, their implications in terms of Jesus the Messiah. So it's going to be an awesome week. Thank you so much for listening. Coming up next, the Terry and Jesse Show, High Impact Catholic Talk Radio coming at you. It's time for me to turn off the light dojo. And thank you for listening. Bye-bye. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were opened to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, 
you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church, so I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most